Um, this is neuromarketing and effects of data, optimization and control. Uh, a marketing firm convenes a focus group to find out how people feel about a new advertisement for dish soap. But rather than surveying the participants' reactions after the viewing, the firm uses emotion detection technology to track the viewers' changing feelings as they watch the ad in real time. Meanwhile, their colleagues are trying to discover what customers think about the dish soap itself. They install a webcam in a grocery store to scan the faces of browsing shoppers and record their affective responses to the bottle in its natural habitat. Both sets of researchers rely on data analysis and visualization software that displays the subject's affective or emotional states in a legible dashboard presentation. Put to use by marketers, these emotion detection technologies enlist machine vision enabled cameras to record people's facial micro expressions and convert these embodied affective responses to products and advertisements into analyzable data. One of a host of biometric techniques adopted by the growing neuromarketing industry. This emerging technology views the face as a rich, readable source of market research data, enabling its users to instantaneously and imperceptibly mine consumer sentiment without the interference of language or even cognition. As a result, this quantification of affect reorients the work of marketing toward developing new capacities to surveil and track, to personalize and predict, and perhaps to control. In this presentation, I will examine the face scanning, emotion recognition applications developed by industry leaders Emotion and Affectiva. I will consider this technology's place in the context of expanding datafication and surveillance, observe how it has been adopted and put to use, and investigate the as yet unrealized desires it provides fuel for. Connecting these techniques to increasingly sophisticated regimes of surveillance, including facial recognition systems, big data driven sentiment analysis, and methods of market segmentation based on psychological data, I will explore not only the desire to enlist emotion detection in passively exploiting affective labor on behalf of the advertising industry, but also to predict and actualize desired emotional outcomes. While it is important to acknowledge that these technologies are relatively new and yet to be implemented on a large scale, their increasing ease of use and their ability to be connected to other biometric technologies and automated optimization systems suggests that their significance and presence in everyday life will grow. A future where advertising, social media platforms, and personal and in-home technologies are designed to be emotionally sensitive and responsive rapidly approaches. What do these technologies reveal about the desires that drive contemporary capitalism? And where might these desires lead, and what effects might they have on our emotional lives? While neuromarketing can be understood as a discrete historical phenomenon, marketing firms and corporations have long sought ways to know as much about the thoughts, feelings, and intentions of consumers as possible. Instead of scanning faces, early iterations of the focus group, like in Mad Men here, might have employed experts in psychoanalysis or body language to discern the unspoken feelings or irrational impulses behind consumers' choices. However, neuromarketing represents a significant advancement over these indirect methods for those seeking to open up the black box of consumer subjectivity. Through neuromarketing, market researchers can purportedly access the unconscious and the emotions directly and in real time. I work here is the conviction that by circumventing language and reading the body, neuromarketers can uncover consumers' precognitive, affective responses without the corrupting influence of language, social pressure, or culture. Technology that has the ability to penetrate people's discursive facades allows marketers to discern, as one marketing scholar put it, the differences between what people do and what they say. According to neuromarketing advocates, techniques like brain scans and biometrics Rationalize, rationalize marketing itself, saving marketers from the expense and confusion of imprecise tools, even as they help to elucidate, account for, and anticipate the fundamental irrationality of consumer behavior. Neurologist Antonio Damasio's work, demonstrating that the emotions play a major role in reasoning and decision making, and are linked to those processes neurobiologically, is often cited as a key discovery for marketing's turn to neuroscience. Neuroscientists' mapping out of the areas of the brain responsible for the production of emotion led to the development of functional magnetic resonance imaging technology to scan brains and collect physiological evidence of emotional responses. This desire to make visible the physical symptoms of internal emotional processing parallels the impetus behind the research of behavioral psychologists into facial expressions, the research that underpins emotion detection technology. Linking emotions to distinct facial expressions begins with Charles Darwin. Building on Darwin's theories in the 1970s, psychologist Paul Ekman cataloged numerous examples of human facial expressions from different cultures 
to develop the facial action coding system, a taxonomic method of describing visually observable facial movements. That, he claims, indicates seven distinct universal emotions. Looking for a way to incorporate the study of ostensibly invisible emotions and feelings into behavioral psychology's emphasis on the empirical, Ekman framed emotional expression in terms analogous to the, class, the classic model of communication theory. The face acts as a transmitter of signals that are decoded by a receiver. This perspective mirrors marketers' view of cognitive and verbal processing as extraneous or misleading noise. With FACS, if you can observe a subject smiling, there's no need to ask if they are happy. And if smiling is a universal indicator of happiness, it doesn't matter if you don't speak the same language as your subject, or if, like a computer, you're not capable of understanding the peculiar nuances of human language. The desire to effectively communicate with computers is an old one, though most efforts have focused on designing software that can pass the Turing test. A new approach took shape with the publication in 1997 of Affective Computing by MIT engineering professor Rosalind W. Picard. Picard's book is a groundbreaking argument in favor of exploring the potential benefits of, quote, computing that relates to, arises from, or deliberately influences emotions. Her case hinges on two related claims, that emotion is a key component in human reason and intelligence, and that machines will never be able to communicate with humans unless they can see and understand emotion. Two companies led the development of emotion detecting software. Effectiva, founded by Rosalind Picard, and Emotion, which was spun off from work done in the Machine Perception Laboratory at UC San Diego. Paul Ekman later joined Emotion's board, and the company was bought by Apple in early 2016. Affectiva continues to develop new affective computing products today. Before moving into the commercial sector, both companies pursued medical applications for their technology, such as aiding people living with autism or gauging the responses of nonverbal patients. Affective and Emotion's emotion detection applications use a machine vision-enabled camera and an algorithm based on FACS to analyze faces, detect and interpret their expressions, and, the, and then display the resulting data to users through an analytic dashboard. The products have been adopted by a range of clients to gauge consumers' affective responses to products and other objects of study. As Emotion's website puts it, their cloud-based services deliver direct measurement of a customer's unfiltered emotional responses to ads, content, products, and customer service or sales interactions. Emotion detection software's ability to sense unconscious, unconscious or even unwanted emotional reactions holds great appeal to marketing researchers looking for deeper insight into their customers. And the software doesn't just tell corporations how their customers feel about their products, it also claims to aid in anticipating emotionally driven consumer decisions. Emotion detection technology only needs an internet connected camera to work, which means that product research can occur in the wild allowing software-enabled cameras and retail outlets to gather data on shoppers' unprompted feelings about products outside of the artificial setting of a focus group. The software has also been used to analyze the reactions and attentiveness of an audience watching a political debate and of spectators attending a basketball game. On a more interpersonal level, one of Emotion's earliest commercial projects was to create a sentiment analysis app for Google Glass so that, quote, salespeople who wear glass can use it to measure how customers respond during their interactions and then get instant feedback that can help tailor their responses. That app died with Google Glass, but it provides a suggestive preview of the emotionally optimized capitalism. In what other directions might the combined power of marketing and technology firms lead? Emotions and affective as patent applications, as well as those made by third parties that rely on their technology, can provide insight into the landscape of the corporate imaginary. Uh, this is a selection of some of the patents that are out there. Um, Sales projections based on mental states, predicting purchase intent based on affect, video recommendation based on affect, optimizing media based on mental state analysis, image analysis for attendance query evaluation, collection of affect data from multiple mobile devices, mental state while being monitored. Some of the key themes here include predicting decisions, improving content recommendations, and otherwise optimizing digital media experiences and enhancing user surveillance, including tracking affective states across devices, monitoring the mental state of individual attendees to events, and, co and combining emotion detection with other biometric techniques to deliver a multifaceted view of subjects' mental health. T taken together, the actual and speculative applications for these products belong to a social and technological complex defined by three major trends. The first is the deification and subsequent commodification of human feelings. Whether taken in aggregate or assigned to individuals' personal data profiles, 
value of this data drives the second trend, the increasingly ubiquitous surveillance of not just our actions and appearances, but our affects, emotions, moods, and mental states. Finally, the data collected through these surveillance regimes carries the potential to be used to influence, manipulate, or control human emotions and behavior. Collecting data about people's feelings and sentiments about consumer goods, cultural productions, or political issues has a long history. The big data-driven sentiment analysis is the most relevant antecedent to this technology. Like emotion detection, sentiment analysis involves a technologically-assisted evaluation of data in order to discern underlying sentiments. But sentiment analysis is limited to the analysis, analysis of text. Thus, despite its pedigree as a big data tool, and the fact that it mines data from freely voiced rather than elicited opinions, sentiment analysis is still vulnerable, vulnerable to the same charges of unreliability as traditional market research, compounded with the challenge of training software to understand human language. Linguistic data poses a problem for artificial intelligence that emotion detecting cameras can solve by making faces and bodies and therefore affects and emotions machine readable. Why gather this data? One answer is contemporary capitalism's appetite for feedback. The perceived utility of emotion detecting tools reflects the marketing, marketing industry's investment in the emotional connection between customers and brands. In a mutually constitutive process, affective consumer surveillance is both a product of and a support for belief in that bond. Providing marketers with evidence of its existence, as well as feedback they can use to develop or modify their products or campaigns, and thus strengthen our affective attachments. Emotional data also has exchange value, and is subject to the same processes of commodification as other forms of personal data. The development and use of emotional data can therefore be added to existing critiques of the invasiveness and exploitation that can characterize the data economy. However, the deployment of face scanning technology in public spaces, or by our personal devices, pushes the non-consensual aspect of this exchange into new territory. To reiterate, this technology is yet to be implemented, implemented on a mass scale, but it is not difficult to foresee its widespread adoption by the marketing industry. As Andrew McStay has noted in his research on this emerging, emerging industry, advertising practitioners, quote, see use of data and emotions collected in public spaces as inevitable. Beyond advertising, Facebook provides a clear example of a corporation with a massive user base, low concern for privacy, and an established appetite for personal data that is frequently proven to be invested in tracking, studying, representing, and influencing its users' emotional states. Whether through their notorious mood-manipulating emotional contagion study, the introduction of emoji reactions, or recent revelations that they monitored the emotional states of Australian teenagers to determine when they felt insecure or anxious. Danielle Davis's recent essay on Facebook's new artificially intelligent suicide prevention tool attests to the level of intimate insight into its users that the company can generate. As Davis notes, Facebook's willingness to intervene in this problem is in many ways to be commended. Rather than feigning the kind of disingenuous neutrality that Charlton Gillespie has identified as characteristic of many new media platforms, Facebook appears to be acknowledging some of the enormity of their social power. However, as Davis notes, Quote, the company's altruism is inextricably bound up with its business model. And Facebook's solution to suicide prevention happens to be the same as its solution to how to make money. Namely, the constant monitoring of its users' behavior, and an ever-broadening approach to the collection and analysis of data about that behavior. In the good name of suicide prevention, therefore, Facebook can justify paying extremely close attention to its users' emotional states, storing those observation, observations in databases, and perhaps selling them to advertisers. These visions of marketing's future follow what Mark, Andre Mark Andreevich has called drone logic. Inspired by military drones, contemporary icons of automated surveillance, Andreevich uses the term to describe the deployment of ubiquitous, always-on network sensors for the purposes of automated data collection, processing, and response. Perhaps understandably, marketing scholars, scholars prefer a different term, nanomarketing, so named due to the possibilities presented by nanotechnology and the arrival of miniaturized, portable, non-intrusive, and wireless devices that can be used to monitor consumers' mental states in their everyday lives. Techniques of surveillance that work for monitoring customers can also find application in the workplace. Inspired by sentiment analysis's perceived utility as a consumer research technique, as Thorsten pointed out earlier, corporations have begun using the same textual data crunching tools to uncover their own employee sentiments. For example, IBM has begun data mining their internal social networking site. According to journalist Kaveh Waddell, 
an internally developed sentiment analysis tool called, tool called Social Pulse monitors posts and comments for trends and red flags. Nonetheless, corporate managers are aware of the limitations of computer-processed linguistic data. And Waddell concludes by noting a recent research project that used surveillance cameras and facial scanning to detect employees' emotions as they enter the workplace each morning. Adele Products' patent application that uses Affectiva software for security breach prediction based on emotional analysis reveals one of the anxieties that produces desire for emotional workplace surveillance, preventing corporate malfeasance perpetrated by employees. Through this hypothetical product, quote, protection is provided by a security system that monitors and analyzes user activity, estimates emotional states of users, and determines the likelihood of an attack. It follows, then, that emotion detecting technology holds appeal for agents of state surveillance, especially given the existing infrastructure for monitoring and analyzing faces. Indeed, the fact that Paul Ackman has worked with the CIA, the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, and others to help develop both people and machines that read faces for emotions offers a clear example of how emotion detection technology might lend itself to reinforcing unequal power structures. The facial action coding system is claimed to be universal and free from cultural biases. But its biologically essentialist perspective ignores, completely ignores the social dimension of affect and emotion. Simone Brown has dismantled the idea that biometric technologies, especially those directed at the surfaces of bodies, can somehow circumvent the histories of racial discrimination and oppression within which they ori originated. Affectiva has already adjusted their technology to account for a perceived difference in the social function of smiles in, in Japan. And while they claim that machine learning can solve the problem inherent to the FACS model, the potential for this technology, like other machine learning applications, to perpetuate or enable new discrimination will require critical attention as it spreads. That concern derives from the way affective data and emotion detection have been and could be used to control our experiences and actions. As in the case of recommending media content based on our personal emotional profiles, predicting choices easily slides into suggesting, managing, or creating desired consumption outcomes. The logic of corporate branding already calls for using, influence, using emotion to influence consumers. So the idea of marketing firms using emotional data to, in order to modulate rather than merely monitor consumer behavior follows naturally. Embracing emotionally enabled technology will lead to devices that can detect our feelings, or rather what their designers program them to understand as feelings. And, we'll act, and our devices will act on that data by making changes to our environment to produce a predicted, more optimal emotional response. Whether through recommending content or personalized interactive advertising, marketers and media firms clearly desire to gauge our affective and emotional states in order to influence our experience of the world. Video games are one arena for experimenting with, with incorporating emotional responses into controlled experiences. Game developer Flying Mollusk Studio, for example, licensed Affectiva software for use in the virtual reality version of their game Nevermind. To play the game, users put on a VR headset, which monitors their emotional reactions to the unfolding story and increases the game's difficulty in response. As the studio's description puts it, the game provides an immersive digital experience where the player is not only completely surrounded by the digital world, but that world is also listening to them and responding in real time to their feelings of stress and anxiety. Nevermind's cybernetic logic of feedback and response is a microcosm of theoretical elaborations of what Gilles Deleuze called the society's control. Patricia Clapp explains that control aims at a never-ending modulation of moods, capacities, affects, potentialities. Assemble genetic codes, identification numbers, ratings, profiles, and preference listings. That is to say, bodies of data and information, including the human body as information and data. Control operates within an affective economy that aggregates human life into quantitative data sets in order to analyze them probabilistically, probabilistically and to structure them into classes based on these predictions. Shoshana Zuboff names this data-hungry manifestation of capitalism Big Other. A, ubiqu a ubiquitous networked institutional regime that records, modifies, and commodifies everyday experiences from toasters to bodies, communication to thought, all with a view to establishing new pathways to monetization and profit. Emotional recognition technology is embedded within this regime, recording our feelings, modifying them through content recommendations, or through the longer process of iterative product development, and commodifying our unconscious, affective responses to products, experiences, communications, information, and social interactions. Adopted more broadly, the identification of feeling could lead to new systems of classification and structuration based on emotions. 
as well as the problematization of non-normative or undesirable feelings. Andrew McStay notes that currently the main barrier to widespread adoption of emotion detection by the advertising industry is the lack of an accepted industry-wide standard for the data. And as Adrian McKenzie reminds us, prediction using machine learning assumes the existence of relatively stable classifications. In other words, the desire for spread of emotion detection technology, its attendant data, and powers of prediction will rely to some degree on standardizing emotions and affects. Affective and emotion both present their data in familiar dashboard-style interfaces. And as Rob Kitchen, Tracy Lorio, and Gavin McArdle have argued, dashboards are not transparent, ideologically neutral instruments. Data dashboards draw epistemological parameters around their subjects. In the case of emotion, dashboards discursively produce the emotions they claim to detect, reify the scientific model of emotion that they are based on, and thus serve to establish and define emotional norms. As Simone Brown points out, biometric technology reinforces ideologies of race and gender and marginalizes those who do not, do not fit easily into existing categories. Applying this insight to the potential establishment of emotional norms by emotion detection technology, there is a cruel irony. This technology that was originally conceived of in part to assist people living with autism or other forms of neurodiversity may now be put to work deline delineating and policing the boundaries of emotional normativity. Great.